You'll have to forgive me. It's been several weeks since I've preached, and I was ready, ready, ready to go uh, just a second ago. I'm still ready now, but uh, got up a little bit too early. It's good to be back home. Uh, we have been away for a few weeks uh, on family vacation, and, and last week, well, last Sabbath I was here. I preached for first service. The week before that, we were doing some work in Oakland, California, and we're glad to be back. We thank the Lord for safe travel, and you look good. It's good to see you. <laughs> and today we're beginning our revival for the month of August, and so we'll be here every Sabbath and every Wednesday. So Sabbath morning times are exactly the same, 9 a.m. and 11.30. You can come to either service. We're doing a quiz at both services, and you saw what uh, Pastor Cheatham has to offer to us and everything, so hopefully you'll participate. Hopefully you'll take notes during the messages to make sure that you can uh, study so that you can get a good quiz score and uh, come back and be a part of that with us. So we have a lot of fun with those. It's a lot of fun, so please uh, participate if you would. And uh, we're also excited about our fast. Let me tell you how this works. So every time we have a revival time, every time we do something intentional about evangelism, we believe that the devil also gets more intentional. And he may actually begin to do things against the people that you're trying to invite to come. He may even try to med meddle in your own life to make it so you don't come out and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that we're praying more earnestly and that we're seeking the face of God during this time as we pray for missing members, as we pray for God's outpouring of his spirit and all of that. And I believe one way to do so is to not just pray but also to fast. Some things only come through prayer and fasting. Who says amen to that today? Now before you get scared, don't worry. The fasts that we do are going to be other than complete fasting from food. There will be different kinds of fasts that we employ. And I'm hoping that you'll join me in the weekly fast every single week. So the way I'll do it is, right before the sermon, like I'm about to do right now, I will announce what our fast is going to be over. We're going to fast from something for that entire week. And then next Sabbath... I'll announce it again, a new one, and then a new one, and a new one. So hopefully, hopefully you'll be willing to join. This Sabbath's fast is on negativity. A fast from negativity. Do you understand what that means? That means for one week, there's no complaining, no grumbling, no gossiping. I just messed up somebody's life just now. <laughs> for a whole week. If you are a parent and you have children, for this one week, when you're talking to your kids and they ask you something, you cannot say no. No negativity. Now, hold on. Listen to me carefully before you lose your mind. That doesn't mean you have to give your kids everything they want. It just means you have to be more creative in giving them that response. So, when my son asks me later if he can have four chocolate chip cookies, I'll say, you can have two. Or, can I have these chocolate chip cookies now? I'll say, son, it's 11.30. You can have some in the morning. Did I give him what he wanted right then? No, but I didn't use the word no. This is going to cause you to stretch as a parent. I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of times it's very easy for us to just say no to our kids. It's simple. But it produces an atmosphere of negativity that we don't even realize we're doing. Be creative this week. Be creative this week. And instead of saying no... Find another way to tell them they can't have whatever it is you don't want them to have. <laughs> Here's why we chose this particular fast. Because I believe it is impossible for us to do it on our own. <laughs> Anybody here haven't been negative for uh, uh, even 24 hours? You complained just now when I said, oh, we're doing a fast? <laughs> So this week, what it's going to mean is, I'm going to need to ask for God's Spirit to be with me even more to be able to accomplish this thing that I'm trying to do this week. If I want to really fast from negativity, I've got to be on my knees praying. Because I tend to be a negative person, especially when certain things that rub me the wrong way start to happen again. This week, no negativity. Got it? Yeah, take that to work. You know, you're not, when your boss asks you to do something, do not complain. Just do it. And do a good job. And do it with a smile on your face. Like you wanted to do it. <laughs> All right. That's our fast for this week. 
hopefully you will join. In fact, if you're going to join me in that fast, say amen. amen. Okay, good. Wonderful. One more thing. She asked me not to do it, but I have to because it's the Sabbath. And something happens special when this happens on the Sabbath. Today is our daughter Julia's birthday. She's 12 years old. And, and whenever your birthday falls on the Sabbath, I believe you get a double blessing. So I wonder if on three you can say happy Sabbath birthday with me to Julia. Can we do that? Ready? One, two, three. Happy Sabbath birthday. Happy birthday, Juby. <laughs> She, when she asked me not to do it, that's when I determined I definitely have to. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm not. Sorry, not sorry. You've seen that before, right? So the negativity fast starts tomorrow, so she can complain all she wants about the fact that I did that, but tomorrow she can't complain anymore. <laughs> Happy birthday. So, as we said, beginning right now, we're starting our revival called Rooted in Christ, and we're actually looking at uh, fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're going to do that for nine different meetings starting today. So we have every Sabbath in the month of August, and there are five Sabbaths in August, and there are four Wednesdays in August. On Wednesday night when we come, we're going to be in this building, in this room, here in this sanctuary at 7 o'clock. Normally, you're used to us being over at the Keystone Room. We decided to do everything here in the sanctuary, and so when you come on Wednesday night at 7, uh, we'll be excited for you to be here. We'll sit somewhere in the middle so that even though there's not as many of us, we can have a, a nice, uh, warm atmosphere and everything, and hopefully you'll come be a part of it. If you have to work, and you're going to be hungry, just come here. We'll have some food in our fellowship hall around 6 o'clock or so. And so you can get some refreshments and then come on over and be rejuvenated and ready to go as we continue together uh, in our meeting. So nine different fundamental beliefs that we're going to look at. And the reason we're doing this is because over the years that I have found an increasingly disturbing fact to be true. You know what that is? Many Christians do not know what they believe. And Seventh-day Adventists are not the exception. We're included. Many of us don't know what we believe. So I thought to myself, we got to do something about this. We have to find a way to change that in our church. And so I thought, if we go through some of our fundamental beliefs, that might help us. Now, it turns out that you may think that now that we're doing this subject, you can't invite your friends and family to come if they're not also Seventh-day Adventists. But it's not true. You know why? Because every one of our beliefs is founded in Scripture, and it's centered and rooted in Jesus Christ. That's really the point of this. The point of this is to look back at the things that we think we know already and to re-understand them under the light of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them is rooted in him. So you don't have to feel any kind of way. You can be safe in bringing your friends and family out uh, when they come. So invite them, bring them in your car, do whatever you have to do to get them here so that we can enjoy this time together. So today, I want to start with fundamental belief number four. Number four is God the Son. That's the fundamental belief. And what we're going to do every time before the sermon, after we hear what the fast is going to be, we're going to read through the fundamental belief together. We have it on the screen for you. And this is so that you can't say that you never read that fundamental belief before. <laughs> you will have read it at least once when you come here to our church during this revival. So, I would like us to read it together. This is fundamental belief number four, God the Son. Are you ready? Let's read. God the Eternal Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ. Through him, all things were created. The character of God is revealed. The salvation of humanity is accomplished, and the world is judged. All of that through Jesus Christ. Forever truly God, he became also truly man, Jesus the Christ. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived and experienced temptation as a human being, but perfectly exemplified the righteousness and love of God. By his miracles, he manifested God's power and was attested as God's promised Messiah. He suffered and died voluntarily on the cross for our sins and in our place, was raised from the dead and ascended to minister in the heavenly sanctuary in our behalf. 
He will come again in glory for the final deliverance of his people and the restoration of all things. Who says amen today? Isn't that a beautiful fundamental belief? I'm wonderful. I'm glad to hear that. And I believe that wrapped up in that fundamental is something wonderful for us to understand about Jesus Christ. I can't preach that whole fundamental today. That would take the entire month of August. But instead, we're going to look at one part of that. This morning, I want to discuss Jesus as a unique figure in the Godhead in this message entitled, Jesus, the One and Only. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to learn something more about Jesus. I thank you that he came to this earth, that he lived a perfect life, that he died for our sins, and then rose and took his rightful place at the right hand of the Father, pleading his own blood on our behalf even as I speak. Father, I ask a special blessing on every person who is listening to this message today, whether here or online, that you would bless us with an understanding of Jesus that would elevate our understanding of you, so much so that we would want to live our lives for you until you come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. John chapter 1. What book did I say, everybody? John chapter 1, starting in verse 1 and reading to verse 5. By the way, I brought this up with me because I think you have one maybe in your bulletin. This is a little invitation card that you can use to invite people to come out to the revival that's happening every Sabbath and Wednesday. And if you don't have one, I believe we have some in the foyer there. We have some uh, on the way out as you go out, whichever exit you use. Uh, pick up a couple of them and, and invite your friends and family to come and be here with us. All the information they need is right there on the card. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, reading to verse 5. This is the New King James Version, and since we did not have a scripture, I would like you to read with me today, if you would, from the scripture on the screen. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him... Nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Who says amen to God's word today? Jesus, the one and only. John, the writer of his self-titled gospel, the apostle whom Jesus loved, and therefore eyewitness of the life of Jesus Christ, writes his gospel with a singular aim noted in the 20th chapter and the 31st verse of his book. Here's what he says. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John makes no bones about it. He is writing to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah. He is up front with his intent, and we must not ignore this fact while reading his gospel. And from the outset, John opens up with a remarkable statement. Here in John chapter 1, he does not warm up his reader first before making his provocative proclamation. He goes right for the jugular, so to speak. He hits the readers right between the eyes, and we are excited that he chooses his course of action. For in his statement lies the key to understanding the true nature and identity of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand his nature if we are going to accept who he is and be able to be saved. Our acceptance of Christ is paramount paramount to our salvation. So I, for one, am glad that John chooses to point him out to us. What about you today? Much has been made about Christ becoming a man, and this is an amazing thing. But would it really mean anything if he wasn't first God? What if Jesus was created by God? How significant would his death then be for us? 
What does it matter if a created being comes to earth and dies for the sins of humanity? So John begins his gospel with these immortal words. In the beginning was, what everybody? The Word. Wow, what a statement. In the beginning was the Word. But why is this statement so meaningful? Because one commentator puts it this way. In the beginning recalls the opening words of Genesis 1-1, which are, in the beginning, God did what, everybody? Created the heavens and the earth. The expression does not refer to a particular moment in time, but assumes a timeless eternity, a time where there was no time. There was a period in history where, where there really was no universe. Did you know that? <laughs> Absolutely nothing existed except Word and God, and the Word was with God, John says. And according to John, the Word was God. This fact excites us because it leads us to our first discovery about the nature of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Jesus is equal with God because He is God. If you believe that, say amen today. In fact, if you believe it, repeat after me. Jesus is God. Jesus. Say it again like you mean it. Jesus is God. If you believe that, say amen today. Now, how do we know this to be true? If you look at your Bibles, you will notice that the word, word, has a capital W. Did you see that on the screen a second ago? Look in your Bible, John 1.1. It indicates to us that this is not simply a regular word word, but in fact, a proper name. We only capitalize proper names unless the word is at the beginning of a sentence. And this word word is not at the beginning of the sentence. It's at the end. In the beginning was the word, but it's a big W. So in essence, what John is saying is that in the beginning, there was this one who is called Word, one whose name is Word, who was with God and at the same time was God. In fact, this Word is a creator. He's the light. He's the champion of salvation. When we look further in the verse, we can see in verse 14 that, God, that John declares the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, this is helpful in pinpointing the identity of this proper name word. Who is this word? The only being in the universe who became flesh and dwelt among us is Jesus Christ. This is, one of, the utmost, this is of the utmost importance today because of an old teaching that has crept up back into our church that is very popular that I'm not sure you know about. It is an anti-Trinitarian teaching that's sweeping across Adventism today. And at the root of it is a different understanding about the nature of Jesus. In their teaching, Jesus is a created being who is subordinate to God the Father. Not equal with him. Subordinate. Now, we believe that Jesus was subordinate to his Father while he was here on earth. In fact, we say that Jesus never did anything while he was here on earth on his own power, but only what his Father told him. But they're teaching that Jesus is also subordinate to God the Father in heaven. Before he was born, excuse me, before he came to this earth and afterward, Jesus is not equal, but subordinate. Jesus is under God, they say. But the danger in that belief is that if Jesus is a created being, it dramatically alters his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Did you know that? Dramatically alters it. Because what difference does it make if somebody who's created died for me? What does that matter? I need the one who created me to die for me. So, if this is so dangerous, how in the world can we tell the difference? How do we know the truth about Jesus? How can we tell? All you have to do is look for the signs, and the signs are right there in the text. Let me illustrate. My wife likes to shop, but there's one who likes to shop more than her. It's her mother. And April and Mama went to a consignment shop a few years ago, in search of some expensive handbags. They wanted purses. They were looking for purses. 
purses that normal people can't afford, so you go to a consignment shop where the prices are dramatically reduced. The problem, though, is that if you don't know what to look for, you might buy a purse that is a fake. And so you want to get the real deal. And it just so happens that April's mother, our mama, is a professional shopper, so much so that she knows the difference between the real and the fake. And I didn't know the difference, so I wrote some of the stuff down that she told me. Let me tell you about a few handbags. Louis Vuitton bags. Some of y'all may want to write this down if you need it later. Louis Vuitton bags have a yellow mustard stitching on the handle and are sealed with a burgundy trim. If that's not there, it's not a real Louis Vuitton. Some of y'all checking your bags right now. Wow, okay. <laughs> all the hardware on a Chanel bag should be the same. If you look at the bag, all the hardware should be the same. If it's not the same, if anything is different, it's not a real Chanel bag. They found an expensive coach bag, and they thought it was real, but they figured out it wasn't. You know what's different about coach bags? All the C's on a coach bag have to be going the same direction. And on this bag, there was one C that was turned a different direction. And Mama knew right away, this is a fake. Not the real thing. She knew what to look for. She knew the signs. She knew what made it the real genuine article. And so for her, even though it was very close, she could tell by just a little thing, this is not the real deal. Well, the same is true for us in this situation. John puts some things in his text to help us to know who it is that he's talking about and to know the real truth about Jesus Christ. The fact that his opening words of his gospel bear this striking parallel to the opening words of Genesis means that John's own particular contribution is to show that the word existed before creation. It's why he starts in the beginning. So you can remember what happened in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, John says, there's a beginning before that beginning. In the real beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God because the Word was God. That's what John says. So Jesus was there before anything else was, along with his Father. He can't be created if he was there all along. So John's making a declaration that Jesus is God and existed before anything else did. He is our creator. John uses a Greek word here for the word word. The Greek word is the word logos. Can you say that? Logos, that's right. It means word, speech, message, book, and volume. That's been translated those different ways. One commentator notes, ordinarily it refers to a spoken word with emphasis on the meaning conveyed, not just the sound. Logos, therefore, is an expression of personality in communication. Scripture also tells us that it has creative power. The word logos has creative power. By the word, this is Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. That word, word, is the same word logos. It's Old Testament here, but the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the same Greek word, logos. That word, word, has creative power. This verse clearly implies that the expression of God had creative power and called the universe into being. And the beauty of John's description in his first chapter is that we can pinpoint the genuine identity of Logos and know who it is with certainty because many great men walked the earth and many of them did great works and had signs and some of them even performed miracles. Many of them displayed similar attributes that our Savior had, but only one has ever come from heaven and made himself into flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is the one and only. If we know what to look for, it's right there in the text. We don't have to be fooled. Jesus is equal with God because he is God. Our second point, and actually I only have two today. Here's our second one, John chapter 1 and verse 14. We just referenced this text a second ago. Let's read it together. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who says amen to God's word today? Here's the second thing that we learn. Jesus is unique in the universe. Repeat after me. Jesus is the one and only. 
Say it again. Jesus is the one and only. You believe that? Say amen today. Jesus is unique in the universe. There is no one like Jesus anywhere. He's the one and only. First, he's the only being that has two natures. How many natures did I say? Two natures. Not a blend of two things. Not a hybrid. He's not half one and half the other, but fully God and fully man at the same time. Do not ask me to explain it. I have no idea how to explain it, but I know it's true. <laughs> this is John's focal point in chapter 1. These five words make all the difference. The Word was made flesh. This is huge. Concept expressed too profound for us to really comprehend. We can only scratch the surface, and yet, even in our scratching of the surface, we receive precious gems of truth upon which we can stand. Look at these passages of Scripture that explain how precious Jesus is and how unique. Here, first on his humanity, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Look what the Bible says. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. He shared in their what? Humanity. So that by his death... He might destroy him who holds the power of death. But, but pause right there real quick. I want, I want to stop for a second because I want you to see something. So first of all, Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews 2, shared in our humanity. So this is crazy because I'm telling you Jesus is unique, and yet at the same time, he's like us. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Jesus shares in our humanity. But even his sharing, he's a little bit different from us. Okay, so it says, uh, to destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who, uh, who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Who are Abraham's descendants in this text? Us, right? Yeah, we've been grafted into the body of Christ. So we're Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he was able to help those who are being tempted. So here's something on Jesus' humanity. Hebrews writer says, he's so much like us, he was made like us in every way. It's a beautiful thing. Jesus' humanity. Okay, look at uh, Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Another text that you already know. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. That last part's really important. So Jesus knows and understands us in an experiential way. He's experienced everything we've experienced as far as temptation is concerned. Beautiful thing. This is how much of a human he was. Jesus took on our humanity so that he could identify with us. And I'm so glad about that. What about you today? Two texts about his humanity. But what about his divinity? Look what Colossians says. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, and then 2, verse 9. The Bible says here, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Let me pause for a second. Stay right there if you would. Go back to that previous slide. I'm going to pause right here because you say, especially if you've heard about this new teaching, you say, there it is, Pastor. The Bible says that Jesus was created, firstborn over all creation. Right? Okay, good. You don't agree. Well, let me tell you what people think. This text is the one that many use to prove that Jesus was created and therefore is not equal to God the Father. But the misunderstanding here is that it doesn't mean firstborn son of God chronologically, but instead covenantally. Let me tell you what I mean. Jesus was not born out of necessity, but deliberately so that he could save humanity. Ty Gibson in his book of the sonship of Christ puts it this way. His sonship is not his, um, his innate eternal identity, but rather a role he took up for a purpose. In other words, Jesus decided to be born, 
But he didn't need birth to exist the way that you and I did. And because of that, he accomplishes in his life, his birth and death and resurrection, the greatest birth that ever was. That's why Paul calls him the firstborn over all creation. Jesus was born on purpose, unlike us. So he's still the firstborn. He's the firstborn. Not chronologically, he was born first before everybody else, but he's the best of all those who have ever been born. You agree with that? Okay, so Paul's not saying here that Jesus was created. We do know he was born, though. Firstborn of all creation. The best born person that ever was. Okay, keep reading. We're still in Colossians 1. Keep reading. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. See, this is how I know that Paul can't be saying Jesus was created. There's no way he's saying Jesus is under God in one sentence. Then the next sentence he says everything we see he cre Jesus created. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense from saying Jesus himself was created and then Jesus created everything. What, did he create himself? All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and him all things consist. Who says amen to God's word today? Amen. Now, Colossians 2, 9. One more text. This one says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, two very important texts about Christ's divinity. And when you hear those texts, it almost sounds like he wasn't one or the other. That's how definitive these texts are. According to Hebrews, Jesus shared both in our humanity, excuse me, according to Hebrews, shared in our humanity, and according to Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead, human and divine at the same time. How that Jesus Christ while retaining the fullness of divinity, took the fullness of, of humanity, we will never know. Maybe we'll know when we get to heaven. But the king becomes servant without actually even abdicating his loyalty, his royalty. He is not half God and half man, not, not uh, God Jr. God is here completely both God and man at the same time. Ellen White says, he's so fully God, it's as if he's not man. And he's so fully man, it's as if he's not God. A concept that's beyond the reach of our mere logic, but it's preciously true. And this is the way that Jesus Christ is unique. He's the only one with two natures. There's none like him in the universe. And guess what? We need Jesus to have both natures in order for us to be saved. As God, he reaches into highest heaven the very throne of the universe where he stands one with the Father, equal with God. He is not God's assistant. He's not God junior. He's not God's creation, but fully and completely creator God himself from everlasting to everlasting, without beginning and without end. And we need this kind of Savior to get us out of this mess. But as man, as man, Jesus reaches to the lowest depths of the human condition and gets all the way down to where I am, at the very bottom of the barrel. He lifts us up, and with a full range of human possibilities at his disposal, he decides to become the lowest of the low, without title, without station, without any world's possessions. He was ordinary people, at home with the poor and the rich, the schooled and the unschooled. He never allowed status or gender or race to be an obstacle between himself and those he came to save. He wanted to demonstrate that no one is beneath his grasp and no one is too low for Jesus Christ to save. We're separated by so many things down here. We separate ourselves by race, by, by political affiliation, by religious background, by worship style. We separate ourselves by gender, age, physical appearance, education. But thank God that none of those things ever stand between us and Him. By the way, don't let anybody make those things an issue. If they're not an issue for God, they should not be an issue in the house of God. Who says amen to that today? But Christ's entrance into the world is unique as well. His nature is unique, but also the way He came into this world. That's also unique. We've never seen anything like that before. Think with me for a second. We know that Jesus was born perfect, just as Adam was born. In fact, the Bible refers to Jesus as the second Adam, right? Adam, it's a nice name, man. So think with me. 
Jesus was born perfect, but he had a slight disadvantage that the first Adam did not have. What is that? Well, Jesus was born into a sinful world, while Adam was born into a perfect world. Jesus was born with a body that was negative affected by, negatively affected by sin. So let me make sure this is clear. Jesus was not born in sin like we are as a sinful human being, but his body was affected by sin. We believe he had what we call sinful infirmities. So Jesus could get tired. Jesus could be uh, hurt. But Adam, in the beginning, he was perfect. We believe he had a perfect body, and he didn't have that same kind of limitation that sin brought on. So Jesus actually came in at a disadvantage. But even with all that, he was still able to fulfill his purpose for which he came. He was our perfect sacrifice, a suitable substitute for our sins so that we don't have to taste the second death. I say again, Jesus Christ is unique. There is no one like him. And it makes him more valuable than anything else in the universe. When I was in high school, I worked at this place called JW. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's been uh, out of business for quite a while. Um, did you ever hear of a store in the mall called Jay Riggins? You ever remember that store? You have to be real old to know that one. It's back in the 90s. Jay Riggins and JW were sister stores, and JW had like a bunch of, um, you remember cross colors? Y'all remember that? Like really baggy jeans and weird colors, stuff like that? I worked at a store like that. And that store allowed me to do something that I always wanted to be able to do, my parents didn't make me pay any bills at home, so all the money that I earned when I was living in high school, I could use to buy the things that I wanted. And there was one thing that I would buy consistently. You know what they were? Nike Air Jordans. <laughs> in fact, I still have some now. I have, uh, um, I'm not going to tell you how many pairs I have. I have some, I have some Jordans. Um, but I only wear the ones that Michael Jordan wore while he was a Chicago Bull. I don't wear the ones that he had when he was a wizard. That was not a part I want to, part I want to forget. But anyway, um, those Jordans, I still remember how much they cost. They were $125 a pair. And that was a lot of money back then. If I could get Jordans for $125 now, that would be great. The cheapest Jordans I can find now, if they're brand new, are about $190. And those are for the low-cut ones. Uh, I guess if you have more material, they charge you more. So the mid-cut costs more than that, and the high tops are more than that. And then if you go onto like eBay, you'll see like collector's editions, like ones that are really, really rare, that can be up to $1,000. I, I don't have any of those. <laughs> uh, birthday gift, that'd be nice. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I don't have any of those. But, but um, here's the thing that I always wonder, because if you really think about it, um, the Jordans are made in China. They're made for much less money than that, and... They're made of material that you're wearing on your feet right now. And, and the shoes you have may be $50 or, or less than that. How is it that anybody will be willing to pay $190 and up for a pair of shoes? It's because it's associated with the greatest player who ever played the game. It's because he is a rare and unique talent that people want to wear something that has his name on it. Are you see where I'm going? <laughs> See, some of us don't realize that we wear the name Christian and it's supposed to have a rare and unique quality. It's supposed to be so valuable that it's priceless. There's not enough money in the world that you could pay to be able to get what Jesus gives. And yet, we treat Jesus like he's lower than a human being, like he's no big deal. And what I'm trying to get you to see today is Jesus is unique. There is no one like him in the entire universe. And he gives you the privilege of bearing his name. You know how much that makes you worth? That makes you priceless. There's no amount of money that anybody could pay to pay for you. But guess what Jesus did? Jesus paid it all by giving his life so that he could buy us back. He owns us already because he created us. Then he buys us back when he redeems us. He's unique in the universe. We should treat him with some kind of honor and reverence. Do you know what I do with my Jordans? I don't play basketball in my Jordans. When I was in high school, sometimes I'd put tape on the bottom of my Jordan so it wouldn't mess up the tread. It's a pair of shoes. How often do I trample Jesus under my actual feet? And there's no one like him in the universe.
as God and man, as human and divine. Jesus reaches high and he reaches low. He becomes the bridge between earth and heaven, the fallen and the unfallen. This attribute is uniquely his, and because of this, it's the reason why he's the world's only hope for salvation. I know, I know that's not a popular thing to say, but guess what? It's true. And guess what? It's true whether you know it for a fact or not. There are people right now who Jesus is saving by his own blood who don't even know how they're being saved. They don't even know. I don't think we even know all the way, and yet we're still saved. Jesus is the only way. Here are some synonyms for unique, just so you know. Here's what unique means. Soul, exclusive, exceptional, distinctive, matchless, irreplaceable, and rare. Jesus is exceptional. He's matchless. He's irreplaceable. Jesus is rare. There's no one like him. He's the most valuable being in our universe. He's the only one that can save us because he's the only one like him. Are you happy Jesus is unique today? Raise your hand if you're happy about that. Are you happy you can have salvation through him today? Raise your other hand. <laughs> now look up and say, I surrender. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me close with this. I read recently about rare blood types. Talking about rare, right? Um, the two most common, first, the two most common blood types are O. I think it's O. No, 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 just regular O. Type O, 46% of people in the world are type O. I think that's the most common blood type. The second most common is O positive, which is 38.4%. Most common blood types. But rare means more precious, usually. So here are some rare blood types. AB negative. Anybody here AB negative? Only 0.7% of the world's population is AB negative. That's less than 1%. 0.7%. The rarest blood type in the world I read about is a type H. H. It's a type of Bombay blood, and only three people in the entire world have it. A nurse in Czechoslovakia, a brother and sister named, last name Jolbert in Massachusetts. Three people with HH blood. Rare blood type. But there is one blood type that's rarer still. SC blood. You ever heard of that before? SC? Because only one person has it. Sin cleansing blood. And his name is Jesus. <laughs> the only one. So you can try to go somewhere else to get your sins cleansed, but they can't do it. They don't have the right blood type. And Jesus says, the blood I spilt covers every single person here so that we can be cleansed. He can turn our sins to whiter than snow. Make us perfect by his rare blood type. There's nobody like Jesus. We need him to be God. We need him to be man at the same time. And by doing that, he creates a bridge between us and heaven so that we can make it there. Aren't you happy about that blood today? <laughs> so excited about what Jesus Christ has made possible through his blood. So what we're going to find in this month of August is that every single one of our fundamental beliefs is rooted in Jesus Christ. We can find it all in the Bible, it's all scriptural, but every single one has its root in Jesus. If you don't see the fundamental through the prism of Jesus, you're losing something valuable. You're missing it. So I hope you come back Wednesday night. I hope you come back next Sabbath and you keep coming back. I hope you bring your friends and family with you so that we can see that Jesus Christ is the root of everything that we do. I want to be rooted in Christ. What about you today? If you want to be rooted in him, why don't you stand to your feet with me right now? Just stand. And we'll pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to be rooted in you. 
In the Old Testament, the Bible teaches us that basically the only ones who were saved were the ones who came through Jewish lines. And none of us here are related to Abraham. Well, we are kind of, but we're not Jews. It turns out that Jesus does something for Gentiles like us that grafts us into that family, that makes it possible for us to be able to be saved. And only he could accomplish it. And so we thank you for that unique and rare person of Jesus Christ. But Lord, I also thank you that you're not only unique, but in some ways you're just like us. You came down and became a human being and were tempted in all points just like we are so that we might become the righteousness of God in you. And we're standing today saying we want to really be rooted in Christ. We want to have all the things that we believe in everything. We want it all to come through Jesus because we recognize today that we're nothing without you and if we don't have you, we're utterly lost. So God, remind us today about what Jesus Christ is. Help him to be our all in all so that we can be saved when you come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let everyone who loves God say together, amen and amen.